So with that, I think uh, we're ready to head into our first presentation uh, an overview this evening from Ellen Ford, who's the Deputy Chief Operating Officer at Berkeley Lab. And she's gonna just give us the, the latest uh, information. Michael uh, will not be here with us this evening, but I'm sure he'll be attending future meetings, but we welcome Ellen to our CAG meeting this evening. Take it away, Ellen. All right, thank you. Nice to see everybody. Yeah, Michael couldn't be here tonight because he's actually in uh, Washington for a few days. Um, on lab business. So um, so anyway, I'm happy to be here in his stead. And I'm going to give you an update on some of the projects that I think he's he's uh, showed you in past meetings. Um, so there's not a ton of new information here, but just to keep you up to date on where things are, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Can you all see that? Looking good. Okay, great. All right. Um, so the first thing to talk about is the is the state grant that we got for wildfire mitigation. So I think you've Michael's talked about this in, in previous meetings, but we were so uh, fortunate to be able to continue to work with Cal Fire um, for helping with fire mitigation from you know all of the trees that we have uh, at the lab property. Um, and this is a, a again a two point million dollar grant that we have from them. So we're really excited to get started on this work. Um, and uh, it's been progressing um, through sort of uh, the, all the planning stages. And so right now where we are is we're about to execute the contract. We, we're we're going to be releasing a request for proposal in about two weeks. Um, and then uh, later in the spring, we'll be able to um, we'll be able to award that contract and get started in the summer and fall. So we're really excited about that. And just to remind folks of sort of the areas of where the mitigation is going to be happening. So this is where we'll be taking out trees um, that will be, um, you know, uh, would help to stop fires from traveling up uphill and to the side of the hill um, uh, to our neighbors, right, in Berkeley. Um, so these yellow areas really show you where some of those largest and densest areas are where they're going to be going ahead and removing some trees. So that's where we are with that, um, with that project. The Centennial Bridge project is, of course, a project that we're we're very interested in because it's um, impacts us, goes over uh, the laboratory, and really that connect is a connector between one side of the lab and and the East Can what we call the East Canyon and the other. Um, so we are really excited about this the work um, that's happening with this bridge. So they're going to be they completed um, this concrete pour after the last CAG meeting. So in late January. Um, they completed the slab pour. Um, they're going to be opening, slated for opening in summer um, of this year, which is really exciting. Um, so we're thinking that probably the crossover is likely to happen from the old bridge to the new over a weekend in early May is what, what's currently planned. And then we'll be having a ribbon cutting ceremony um, with the campus um, with UC. Um, and of course, we'll invite CAG members to come to that. And that'll be that'll be slated for sometime in July. So we're really um, we're really glad that this is going forward, and we're going to be excited to get that old bridge um, removed as well. A little bit on the Welcome Center and the cafeteria. So this is what we call our seismic safety modernization um, building. So um, there, uh, th this is you, you've seen pictures of this, I think, previously. Um, but this is sort of a, you know, this was just taken, I think, on Friday, this photograph. So you can see sort of where what what's happening here. They're doing a lot of the, um, the shoring walls, putting in the shoring walls, and then just a reminder of what the building looked like before on the upper right and what it's going to look like afterwards, the rendering. Um, we're obviously really excited about this, and this continues to go well. It's very tricky, right, because it's carved up to the side of the hill. So it's um, a lot of um, shoring has to be done. Um, and a lot of um, piles have to be driven into the, into the ground for to be able to make that work. And then, of course, it's Women's History Month, and we're celebrating at Berkeley Lab as well. Um, and these are just an example of a couple of talks that we're going to be having. They'll be open to laboratory employees, but we will be posting them on our YouTube channel. So we'll share those links when we have those ready. Um, but Dr. Jessica Wade's research um, is going to be featured so she'll be do, she'll be giving a talk, um, and she really um, her um, public engagement work in science, technology, engineering, um, and STEM 
um, also advocates for women in physics as well as tackling systemic biases such as gender and racial bias on Wikipedia. So she's been very active and is um, really entertaining. So I think her, um, her, um, her presentation is gonna be smart and fun to watch. Um, so we'll definitely share that with you. And then um, Greta Vollmer, um, will be um, talking about women, language, and social change. So she considers the way in which language evolves and changes, how things are shaped by our, our contemporary um, linguistic practices. So, you know, it's really about the power that language holds in our day-to-day -day lives, how it changes and affects us. So um, she's received her PhD from Berkeley and we're, um, we're looking forward to her presentation as well. So as soon as we have those links, we will go ahead and share those with you. So let me see, I think that's it. And of course, it looks like my screen has frozen. Bear with me one second. Yes, and that was it for my presentation, actually. That was the last slide. Okay, very good, very interesting, Ellen. Those two speakers that you highlighted there sound fabulous. So I think they're going to be really interesting. So we really would. So we always ask for any follow up comments or questions. And Sarah, you're up next. This is a quick one because I know it was on your slide, but I missed it. When oh. did you see the, the Welcome Center and cafeteria is slated to be complete? So that's in 2026. So we've still got some time. Yeah. OK. OK. Yep. Thanks so much. I just yeah. couldn't quite remember. Yeah. Appreciate it. We can't wait. <laughs> Yes, I can imagine that. Yeah, I mean, we're we're having food trucks right now, and that's sort of helping to get us by. But yeah, we're really looking forward to it. Okay, Lou, go next. Uh, I wanted to ask about the uh, you said you're accepting proposals for the two point nine million. Is that what does that mean? Accepting proposals. So they're they'll send out a request for proposal um, out to the community and then, um, and then, uh, ask for proposals. And I can't remember what the due date will be for the proposals, but that'll be in the next two weeks to get people to come and bid on actually coming and doing work. Oh, I see. So in other words, you've already identified the work. It's the bids you want right now. Exactly. Okay. Very exactly. Good. So it's the bids from the contractors to come and actually come and okay. start Terrific. doing the work. Yeah. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. In that case, I think uh, we will thank Ellen for her brief update here. Thank you, Ellen, for uh, providing that uh, information to us. It's really good to see all these projects moving forward. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to go to our next two speakers, and that will be Ellen, Eleanor Hollander and Elizabeth Redmond Cleveland, and they're going to be talking about the city of Berkeley's economy, a 2023 snapshot. I'm sure we'll all be very interested in that as uh, people who live and work in and around Berkeley. Uh, let's go on to Eleanor to start things off. So please take it away. Thank you so much. It's really appreciate the great introduction and really appreciate you all having us here today. Uh, my name is Eleanor Hollander. I'm the manager of the Office of Economic Development at the city of Berkeley. I'm here with my colleague, Liz Redmond Cleveland, and we're super excited to um, give you all a overview of our city's economy. This is our 2023 economic dashboard. Uh, this document and its companion publication, the commercial district dashboards are available on our website at the city of Berkeley. And we'll be sure to uh, put the link in the chat in case you wanna explore these documents more. Um, and again, this uh, covers data through the year 2023. We recognize it's now March. Um, so, you know, I hope we'll have a little time afterward if you all have some questions about the current as well as the past uh, place we've, we've been. Uh, with that, let's take it away. And thanks to Liz for uh, driving the slideshow here. I really appreciate it. Uh, the employment picture. Uh, unemployment rates increased slightly year over year in Berkeley and beyond. We were, were at 4% unemployment. The county is a little higher, 4.5%. Um, the state is at 4.9%. Um, total jobs in the East Bay increased. Um, year over year. And the largest sort of increases in some sectors, of course, are the arts, entertainment and recreation, construction, leisure and hospitality, and accommodation and food services. This is reasonable in the sense that in 2022, of course, those sectors were particularly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And so to see them rebounding with more jobs and hiring in 2023 is encouraging. 
our largest 25 employers in the city of Berkeley. We in the city are incredibly, um, I want to say, lucky uh, to have a diverse economy. We have education anchors, um, of which I'm sure you're familiar. <laughs> we have uh, large manufacturers and uh, firms that do healthcare related work. And then we have um, manufacturing and research and development firms. We have two that have cracked the top 25 uh, this year that we hadn't seen before. You see Upside Foods in a picture there. Uh, they make cultivated uh, products that taste like meat. And we have um, uh, 12, which uh, works on uh, climate tech solutions. Hi, everybody. I'm Liz Redmond Cleveland, as Eleanor said, and I'll just jump right in here. So our hospitality sector was particularly hard hit during the pandemic, but last year was quite a bit stronger for this industry. So we saw our average nightly hotel occupancy creep up to 70 percent. So that's still below the pre-pandemic levels, but it was higher year over year than 2022 when it was just below at around 69 percent. And also the average daily room rates increased to $181 per night, which meant together that 70% and the $181 uh, per night room rate got us back up to pre-pandemic hotel tax revenues. We call that transient occupancy tax or TOT at the city level. It's a part of what funds the city budget. So it is good news for the city of Berkeley that that crept back up and that people are returning to conferences and events here in Berkeley and using our hotels. And I'll thank the lab probably for some of that hotel attendance. We also work with the partners in Visit Berkeley, which is our convention and visitors bureau. If you don't already know them, you might wanna check out their website, visitberkeley.com because they offer lots of fun things to do. In fact, I used their website this weekend when I had my mother-in-law and uh, in town, we took her to lots of fun places recommended there. But they are about to launch their Berkeley Restaurant Week on March 21st this year. And they did a great job last year really getting people out to special deals and events at Berkeley restaurants. So check that out if you're not already familiar with the Restaurant Week scene. Uh, this is a great month and a good time we're presenting to you today because that's just coming up again. And I'll also mention they pioneered the Berkeley Bucks e-gift card program, which has 115 Berkeley stores and retailers and all kinds of businesses that you can get this e-gift card to give to a friend or employee or uh, co-worker, and then they can spend the money as they wish at any of those businesses in Berkeley using that Berkeley Bucks e-gift card. And then the other thing that's very timely as we speak about this to you this month is that the Bioneers Conference, which is one of the most nationally renowned conferences for people thinking about deep ecological and social footprints and change there, used to be in Marin and it came to Berkeley for the last time, or sorry, for the first time in 2023. And it's gonna be back here this month, starting March 28th in a number of the spaces in downtown Berkeley. And that will bring over 2000 people to our downtown. So that'll be exciting for a lot of the retailers and restaurants and venues in the downtown. So thanks to Visit Berkeley for all they do as partners and check them out. We want to turn now to something that uh, the Berkeley Lab has been a terrific partner in. We work with the lab in the Berkeley Startup Cluster and really work to nurture what we call the innovation ecosystem. And what you're seeing here is a map that you can find on the berkeleystartupcluster.com website. So you're welcome to delve in at any point after this presentation to really learn more about what startups are in our city. But this is showing about 400 innovation companies, including startups that are located across all the council districts, all the neighborhoods of Berkeley, across many different sectors. The largest concentrations are those ones in red and blue and um, purple. So the red ones are software and they're primarily located in offices in and around campus. And then the blue ones for the first time, we're seeing both concentrations in West Berkeley, but then also in the new Baker Labs or Baker Bioingenuity Hub, Old Berkeley Art Museum, Pacific Film Archive site just south of campus. So that's exciting to see that as it emerges a new hub for biotechnology businesses. And then we continue to see a number of hardware businesses in West Berkeley to grow. And I also wanna mention that that pie chart on the right shows you the breakdown by industry sector that they're in. We're continuing to see growth in the clean technology or renewable energy, battery storage, space, which I would say is in large part due to the lab's innovation in that area. So we thank you for any of the uh, startups. When Eleanor mentioned 12, I know they were a Berkeley lab cyclotron road company. So it's great to see those occupying spaces um, outside the lab in Berkeley and continue to employ people here. 
In terms of the 400 companies that I mentioned that spread themselves across Berkeley, the vast majority of them, 81% of those are startups. We try to track these as best we can from year to year. They change on a daily basis. As you may know, startups are in the garage one day and then uh, applying for jobs uh, the next day because it's a hard environment to, to really launch and grow a startup. So I'd say take some of these numbers with you know a little bit of, of flexibility and wiggle room, but we did see that the number of startups, even though it's been a tough time during the pandemic, grew between 2022 and 2023. And I think that's particularly interesting because so many people shifted to remote work where it's hard to really say where a startup is based these days, but there's so much more happening between the Berkeley Lab and the Activate program that spun out and connected to the lab and then also things on campus at the UC campus, that there's just more total entrepreneurship and more startups starting here. So even with more people operating remotely, we're going to continue, I think, to be a hub for those early stage companies. And the other really exciting thing, if you haven't already heard, there's a company called PitchBook, which does a lot of information around deal flow and venture capital. And they put out reports every year of the best universities for venture backed startups. And this was the first time in 2023 that UC Berkeley uh, ranked above Stanford or MIT, some of its competitors as the number one university in producing venture backed startups. So I know UC Berkeley is very proud of that and we're excited that their success in getting that ranking will hopefully also translate into a lot of the spaces in Berkeley being filled with enterprising um, leaders. Last year was a tougher, I will say, for fundraising. The data that I've seen shows that globally, venture capital fundraise in 2023 was down almost 50%. It's like a little over 47% year over year. And uh, in Berkeley, we saw the impacts of that. So we saw fewer companies, although there were still 84 that raised venture seed capital funding last year. And they raised what sounds like a big number, 840 million. Uh, that was down from 2.1 billion in 2022. So it, you know, it was definitely a decrease, though it certainly fueled job and innovation creation last year. And I just wanted to point out for you, I'm not going to go through all these logos you see here on the left, but if any of those interest you, I'm happy to share more. We could talk about the diversity of the companies that raised money last year. There's a couple big things that I'll mention. So Karmat Therapeutics, which develops uh, solutions for metabolic diseases like obesity and diabetes, they actually sold to Roche Pharmaceutical, a big multinational company, in a deal valued at $3.1 billion. So that's a pretty sizable um, acquisition deal that happened in Berkeley with a publicly traded company now operating here when we have few employers of that size. And Cobalt Metals, which uses artificial intelligence to identify locations of those rare minerals that go into electric vehicles and other renewable energy technologies. They closed a round of $195 million last year. It was one of the top deals throughout the Bay Area. And we just heard that they struck copper with their AI, I believe in Zambia, just, just in the last couple of months. So it seems like that's working. And there's lots of other things that happen with actually, we just toured with our uh, Berkeley Ventures, Berkeley Values, STEM career, say TerraPlace, and they do robots that help with the automation of installing commercial scale solar power plants. And they were just ranked in one of the number one clean tech, green tech companies in the US. So lots of cool things happening across biotechnology, plant-based foods, uh, alternative materials, composites, et cetera. And the last thing I'll mention here is even though it was a tough year, for overall venture capital seed capital fundraising, we actually saw the increase in the government research and development grants that were awarded to Berkeley companies go up to 17 million. And I know that some of the companies at the lab have um, really thrived because of those early stage grants they get from the federal and state government. So keep letting them know that that's available and that there are companies or there's organizations out there like Tech Futures Group that will support them in their grant applications and their business plans. Couple of other things that we want to say about life sciences. So that you know has really crept up as a bigger part of our innovation sector portfolio. And there was a report published by our partner organization, the East Bay Economic Development Alliance, which the Berkeley Lab is a part of, last year that talked about industrial jobs throughout the East Bay region. And they looked specifically at which areas have been growing and what kinds of buildings were being put in in the East Bay, and they saw that Northern Alameda subregion, which is the area that includes Berkeley, 
had actually the second highest industrial job growth in the East Bay over the 10 year period studied. That was behind only Southern Alameda, which includes the city of Alameda and that Naval Base, which has been transformed to capture startups. And it was really life sciences or biotechnology, manufacturing and innovation R&D jobs that drove this growth uh, in the industrial area. And then correspondingly, the only flex or industrial real estate category that saw net gains over the 10 year period was for the was the types of buildings that capture those um, biotech and life science and other R&D companies. Let me turn it back to you, Eleanor. Sure thing. Um, so just looking at sales tax more broadly, the picture is a little bit less rosy than the venture uh, po photo, <laughs> the snapshot from venture. Okay, so this is looking at the second quarter, uh, year over year. Again, our sales tax data lags a little bit. So cast your mind back um, to the second quarter of 2023, where our, the city of Berkeley sales tax was down from that same period in 2022. Uh, the county is up, the state is up, um, our city is down. However, we are, you know, in 2023, we were doing better um, than we were deep in the pandemic in the second quarter of, say, 2020 or 2021. So things are returning, but not as um, strongly as they were last year. We could say that. Um, the reach, um, City of Berkeley's um, ground floor commercial picture is a little bit rosier. Uh, overall, our vacancy rate dropped by two tenths of a percent. So we have an 8.1% citywide ground floor vacancy rate. Um, some districts that have decreases in vacancy include North Shattuck and West Berkeley and Solano. Uh, others have larger increases in vacancy, um, sometimes owing to larger floor plate retailers that have gone out of business quickly or sort of the volume of churn of development in some of those areas. Just looking at our sort of ground floor, if you will, by type of use is also pretty interesting. Um, retail comprises the most significant percentage of ground floor space, but food and beverage also represents a pretty large portion. And thinking about our sales tax picture, we're a pretty unique city in that uh, food and bev is a big portion of our sales tax or a bigger portion of our sales tax than um, retail is for most cities. So uh, you can see that sort of borne out also with occupancy at the ground floor. Now, turning back to the office market statistics, as you've all uh, probably witnessed some vacancies in office buildings and heard the news from many of the Bay Area cities, we definitely are seeing that play out in Berkeley as well. So our vacancy rate went up to 13.4%. I remember uh, it being below, I think, 5% when I started this job many years ago. So that's certainly some of the highest it's ever been, though it's nowhere near the vacancy rates that you see in San Francisco or as high as are in, in uh, Oakland or in uh, Emeryville. So, you know, we're kind of middle of the pack there. And then having more vacancy has the positive side, I guess you could say, of the, the price per square foot that businesses are playing, paying for commercial real estate has dropped to $3.45 on average per square foot, whereas it used to be above $4 a square foot. We also wanted to share more on the other part of commercial real estate, which is the lab or the spaces for research and development companies. That's a slightly different story, although you're also seeing increasing vacancy there. So we're looking at a really large number on the slide of 42.1% for lab. And that's because that's including that big new 550,000 square foot property that you might be seeing off the I-80 freeway by the Berkeley Aquatic Park. So that's not leased yet. So if you know anyone interested, it's definitely uh, looking for tenants, but it's actually also not open yet. So I wouldn't be as freaked out by that number as it as it might feel like a really large number. And it still costs a lot to build these types of properties. And there's a lot of specialized equipment and air, you know, system, air filtration systems that go into it. So there's the companies that own these properties are holding steady with an average of about $7 per square foot. So definitely... Uh, even though office rents are down, the prices of lab are still, you know, holding steady at that, that mark of $7. And then we just wanted to share a couple updates with you about what's happening as it relates to the research and development sector or, or office, um, I should say lab spaces. So the lab Berkeley, which is down on, I believe it's 4th and 5th streets. It was developed by a developer called Steelwave open last year and leased to a couple biotech companies there. And Foundry 31, which is just south of Ashby, uh, off San Pablo, near the Emeryville Greenway, it's right at the 
border of Oakland, Emeryville, and Berkeley. They also opened their doors and started leasing last year, already captured two biotech companies that came out of Baker Labs. And we'll be having a meeting there this Wednesday. And um, under construction, we already talked about it. So that's that Berkeley Commons site that is driving up the lab availability. And then this was already mentioned today by one of the participants here, but the new Berkeley Innovation Zone is being planned. And Eleanor has actually been hard at work on the Berkeley Forge site down around 2nd and Gilman, which I believe she'll share more with you about now. <laughs> My favorite topic. Thanks, Liz. Um, perhaps you all are familiar with the former Pacific Steel Casting and Berkeley Forge and Tool Factories. Um, it's a quite a large um, place that has blue pipes and quite a bit of graffiti featured on it. If you're driving on I-80, you can see it. Um, on the right hand, on the left hand side, you can see its current condition. On the right hand side of your slide there, you can see a rendering from June of 2023 um, of what it might look like, nearly a million square feet of research and development and lab space, almost 10 acres, and the new pedestrian bridge and the Gilman interchange uh, right at its foot. Um, other it's a tremendous opportunity. It's very exciting. Uh, the city is hard at work on developing a new zoning designation, MRD, um, and is currently preparing the environmental impact report that accompanies that new zoning designation. So uh, watch this space in 2024. Um, also watch this space. Uh, in 2024 is a picture here of the Golden Gate Fields. We understand they're going to be ceasing operations in July of 24. Uh, this is a property that you know shares a border with Albany. The track itself is in Albany, but the barracks in the south side are part of Berkeley. Um, so that's a new um, area that could be transformative. And then on the right hand side of that is the picture of our uh, intersection of University Avenue and Shattuck. Uh, if built as proposed, 1998 Shattuck Avenue would be the tallest structure in Berkeley, uh, higher than today's Chase Building. This is the site that currently has a McDonald's, the former Missing Link, and um, is right next to Stats uh, Bar. Uh, the housing development pipeline, uh, again, continuing with this trend of really exciting stuff coming our way. You can see here on the left, all the proposed in yellow uh, projects and the entitled projects in 2023 are uh, indicated in orange. They, of course, cluster on the uh, main corridors, San Pablo, Shattuck, Telegraph, and in downtown. Uh, in the final month of 2023, there was a technical term here, a boatload of applications that came in representing nearly 2,500 new housing units. And housing prices uh, in Berkeley, both rental and sales. Uh, the median single family price for a home in uh, December of 2023 in Berkeley is a little over $1.2 million. That is down from the all-time high in April of 22 of nearly $1.8 million or just over $1.8 million. Uh, there's a slight decrease, uh, of course, in the median home price I just described, but also sales volume uh, decreased a little bit. So uh, certainly with the interest rate environment changing, uh, we do see a bit of a softening there. Rental rates also continue to climb, uh, but just not as steeply as in other times past. And now, if you'll permit us, we have a couple of slides here on sort of Office of Economic Development, or OED, as you can see on the slide, our efforts to support local economic sustainability in our city. Uh, the first is, of course, uh, funding. We run two uh, loan programs. Uh, one was a product of the pandemic of the CARES Act funding, and one is a product of um, the 1900s, uh, we were awarded a fund in 1980 and we've been revolving it ever since. Uh, we've got quite a few loans in our portfolio. It's very exciting and um, uh, tremendously rewarding actually to serve on our loan board. Uh, the, this group really sees themselves as advisors and continues to visit all of our recipients every year. And we're also seeking a new uh, loan we board sure member, are. right? If anyone yeah, is you don't have to live in Berkeley, but you do have to have some interest in small business finance and we will teach you the rest. So we would love that. It's a hardworking board, but also a lot of fun and we try to make it um, efficient use of your time. So thank you, <laughs> Liz, for that shout out. Good point. Um, enabling sustainable business networks. That is another big portion of our work in the Office of Economic Development. We pass through a tremendous amount of funding. You can see in the blue pie slice there, um, almost 43% of our budget is dedicated to business improvement districts or funds. Um, BIDs that work to apply their funding to a very specific neighborhood. Um, you can see some here on uh, our map of our Berkeley commercial districts. And um, in 2024, we're looking to establish two new parking-based benefit districts in the Lauren District in South Berkeley and the Gilman Districts. 
Uh, finally, this is an exciting time for outdoor commerce in the city of Berkeley. Uh, May 20th, 2024 marks one year since the COVID-19 emergency ended, at least legislatively in our city. And operators of outdoor commerce, you can see some of them photographed here, have the opportunity to make their spaces permanent with our Path to Permanence program. We've already had uh, one applicant come in and say they love the space, they're super excited, they wanna continue to make it permanent. So shout out to Taste of Himalayas on Shattuck Avenue. Everybody go enjoy their work. And if you see um, some new ones popping up around town, um, that's, just know that they're embracing one of our new and exciting programs that might be a silver lining of our uh, COVID-19 emergency locally. We also continued our hashtag discovered in Berkeley campaign, which we launched several years back in 2019 to actually recognize the businesses you can discover in Berkeley, as well as the discoveries that they're making here. And we brought that campaign to life for the first time at a really awesome new square block, old printing press design, uh, transformed into a meeting venue and event production and studio film space. It's like this really creative space called Seattle Creative Space in West Berkeley. We had over 200 people come out to get to meet the businesses that they can discover in Berkeley and see what can be discovered there. And we're gonna continue that campaign so keep an eye out in Berkeley side for stories about really cool businesses you can discover or follow the campaign on Instagram at Discovered in Berkeley. We're continuing our green business program. So we partner with the California Green Business Network with a local chapter base of the Alameda County Green Business Program and supported 170 green businesses in Berkeley to do everything from you know, water reduction, save the use of kilowatt hours through uh, electricity reduction and divert solid waste from the landfill and uh, reduce their fuel consumption as well. So I think for all of you, I know many of you are sort of environmentally minded being affiliated with the lab and their renewable energy work. We're always looking for new businesses that are interested in getting certification. So if you know of any, please do either let us know or let the business owner know they can go to the greenbusinesscalifornia.org and get more information or sign up to have somebody support them and it will cost nothing because the city of Berkeley funds that contract. We also continue to think about social and sustainability and support the employee ownership of businesses as a way for them to transition when their longtime owners retire or wanna phase out. They can turn that over to the workers and become an employee owned worker cooperative, which is a great way to build wealth. And then we also received a grant and we're able to partner with the National League of Cities and Cities Nationwide I'm really thinking about what we do to support inclusive entrepreneurship in Berkeley and support the scale up expansion and continuity specifically of black and Latinx owned businesses here in Berkeley. And we're still trying to think through how we digest all of the information we receive. But the short answer is that there's a lot of challenges facing small businesses in today's market, whether it be because of city or um, you know national or global challenges that they're facing and we should just do a better job, frankly, of supporting all small businesses and making it easier for them to operate. And that will probably also be really serving the immigrant or disadvantaged um, minority owned businesses that we serve. On the end of equitable development, I think I mentioned this earlier, but just in passing, we've been really lucky to partner with the Cal State Institute for STEM education and with Berkeley High School to take high schoolers on tours of our STEM companies and the, some of those startups that we mentioned in that 400 number earlier. So the kids get to see everything that can be done with their STEM skills from you know finding cures or treatments to diseases to getting um, technology in your home with reducing carbon emissions. So really spanning the range of industries and showing the application of those skills to real world careers. And I will also say I had the pleasure of attending the AP computer science uh, field trip. Uh, these kids are incredible. They pitched a company in, you know, 30 seconds and we were all blown away. So um, <laughs> the future talent pipeline is strong in our city and we are richer for it. Um, speaking of richer for it, we um, also do a tremendous amount of work in our civic arts service line in the Office of Economic Development. We run an incredibly robust grant program with a number of different categories. Uh, in 2023, we awarded over $700,000 worth of grants to arts organizations, festivals, and individual artists in the city of Berkeley. 
And we're really pleased to continue uh, that program in the coming year and add a new and exciting grant program for capital spaces, capital grants for artistic spaces in Berkeley. So that wraps up our work. Um, and thank you for permitting us a little extra time to talk about all of the efforts in our Office of Economic Development in addition to our 2023 economic dashboard. You can find um, these documents here that are on this slide. And if you wanna reach us at the office for anything, um, you're welcome to send an email to OED mailbox there at berkeleyca.gov. And we are happy to try to um, direct you best we can in uh, accessing services, feeling welcome in Berkeley and thriving. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. Fantastic. Thank you, Eleanor and Elizabeth. Great presentation. Uh, and it's nice to get the city view of things and specifically economic development snapshot. That's awesome. Um, having had a lived in Berkeley for many years and a, our business uh, here in West Berkeley for many years. It's, it's nice to see that you're doing everything possible on multiple dimensions to uh, uh, make our city economically viable and uh, socially inclusive and equitable too. All of that rolled into it. So let's see, any questions or comments for our speakers here, Elizabeth and Eleanor? Yes, someone says, a lot to digest, indeed. <laughs> thank you for the nice remarks in the chat. I'm not sure what the etiquette is, but I'll just use my voice and say thanks. <laughs> Much appreciated. All right. So colleagues of Sarah uh, here at the city, how, how do you in the planning department and community development relate to uh, what Eleanor and Elizabeth had to say? We love having them as colleagues. We 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 coordinate on a variety of things, and I I I missed their recent presentation at council. So for me personally, this was fabulous to get this overview here. Um, yeah, you guys did touch on so much. Thank you. One thing that I know I was so fascinated by when I learned about it is what you mentioned, Liz. The support that you give to. Um, business owners wanting to retire in terms of of allowing potentially their employees to take um ownership can you do you have some examples to share of that or well oh, that's a great question sarah did you call on her as a plant we did sort of forget to mention project equity which is our partner we it was mentioned but oh, i think okay. it's 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 interesting so I, I just thought others might like to hear a little more on it yeah great question well succession planning is top of mind to many businesses um I'm sure you all have heard of the silver tsunami and um, folks of a certain generation retiring and trying to think about what it means to leave their business. Uh, and often it is an option to sell the business to their employees. Uh, cooperative ownership is really exciting and Project Equity is one of the leaders in the field that offer assistance to firms doing that kind of transition. Um, the local butcher shop is an example of one. Um, the uh, East Bay Nurse, sorry, not East Bay Nursery, um, Nursery off uh, Hopkins, help me out, Liz. Uh, West, oh my West, West Bray Bray Nursery? Nursery? Yeah, next, well, next to Monterey Market. Berkeley Hort, Berkeley Hort has done it recently. <laughs> Sorry, you're really testing my nurseries of Berkeley knowledge quickly. Um, and a few others in Berkeley, um, Ocean View Diner, for example, in West Berkeley, uh, that was formerly known as Betty's Diner. Uh, you know, we those headlines are hard to read for us too when a business has to close suddenly and there's a number of sort of uh, customers that have a lot of heartfelt thoughts and ideas. And if we can catch it ahead of that point, and if employee ownership is an option, uh, the city is pleased to be able to provide project equity uh, to assist business owners in their transition. Yeah, and I will just say one that didn't work with project equity, but I was literally writing about them just minutes before I joined this call is Sconehenge, the longtime business that's uh, right there next to Berkeley Bowl Original. And they just became a worker owned cooperative last year in 2023. And we're going to be doing our next Discovered in Berkeley article about them in during Small Business Week, which is the first week of May. So check that out. And I believe they're trying to cook up some uh, discounts with you if you either go to Sconehenge or buy them at Berkeley Bowl or one of the local markets. So if you like scones, May may be your month for uh, shopping if you don't get them regularly. They're all now worker owned. Worker owned, I think they um, at this point it's fifteen percent worker owned, I believe, and they'll be transitioning to eighty percent over the next several years. I love the name. That's that's a winner right there. <laughs> yes. Any other questions or comments for uh, our presenters? 
I just wanted to chime in really quickly and say thanks so much to Liz and to Eleanor for the presentation for joining our CAG meeting tonight, but also just being such an incredible partner to the lab. You know, we've got a lot of folks coming out of the lab wanting to, you know, grow their companies, and we really appreciate their sort of like personal touch working with working with small startups to find space to help navigate their way through that like complex process of establishing a business in Berkeley. So we're always grateful for the partnership. And, um, you know, Beth is always a, a great partner at the chamber as well. So we're just really appreciative. Very good. Okay, well, let's thank our two presenters there, Elizabeth and Eleanor. Thank you very much. A good round of applause. And uh, thank you for coming this evening. We're going to go right into our Next presentation from Faith Dukes, who's a director of the K-12 STEM education and outreach program at Berkeley Lab. So we're gonna turn this over to Faith to uh, present her material. Faith, you're up. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. So hopefully everybody can see my slides. It's good. Um, I'm also in the chat going to put in our website for anybody who would like to check it out. So as I said, I'm Faith Dukes. I'm director of the K-12 programs here at Berkeley Lab. Uh, the last time I think I spoke to the CAG was maybe in 2019 or early 2020. So everything that I'm going to share with you has been in development over the past four years um, in thinking about how we as a national lab um, create authentic STEM education programs. So our programs are an extension of community outreach in our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. And tonight I'll talk a little bit about the need for K-12 programs, especially at a national lab, our work-based learning continuum, and how we've been developing and thinking about programs from K through eight and nine through 12 um, in those specific areas. So for us, we think about the strengths of the National Lab. So we have STEM professionals here or here, as well as STEM adjacent professionals that are supporting the mission science. We have cutting edge facilities and active research, and we utilize all of these components in order to build out programs that are specific to students to allow us to make sure we have an impact, um, especially for students here in the Bay Area. So we talked about our work-based learning continuum. The students also are on a work-based learning continuum within the school districts. They have their own kind of continuum that they're looking to of what should students be uh, a part of. So we built our programs to talk about career awareness, career exploration, and so you'll see some emblems of some of the programs that we have, career preparation in terms of some programs, and then career training in a, a full-on internship. And so that allows us to bridge the gap and provide opportunities that are scaffolded based on interest as well as ability of the student. So what we're really thinking of right now, there's a lot of maybe awareness about STEM. And then for DOE, there are a lot of funds that go into supporting community college as well as full uh, four-year institution and early career um, activities that are funded at millions of dollars. So we're bridging this gap in terms of training and pre-college programs where we make sure that students get the information they need in order to move on from high school, go into college, and hopefully continue to engage with national labs in the future. So for us, um, these are from FY23 numbers. We typically have about 10 year round and special one day programs that we host at the laboratory right now. We've moved from virtual to hybrid to in-person over the past four years. We typically have about 250 active Berkeley Lab volunteers. We hope to get that up to about 400 in the next couple of years with over 2,500 service hours that they dedicate towards the programming that we do. In FY23, we uh, interacted with about 3,900 students and educators, but this year we're already at 3,300 and we hope to hit the 4,000 mark um, by the end of the fiscal year that we'll have uh, career talks, classroom visits, go to career fairs, um, STEM nights, and other opportunities that we engage with students. And we should have about 193 or so summer trainees, camp participants, and interns by the end of the year. And I'll talk more about what that looks like 
So for us, what does K, K through eight programming look like? I know people who have been in Berkeley for a long time remember like the fifth and sixth grade trips to the lab to do hands-on activities. We haven't replicated that just yet, just because we think about the logistics of having students come up to the laboratory, we could actually go to them. So what we've done is a few things that we've implemented this year. Um, we um, are looking at one, we have gone to all of the sixth graders and eighth graders by April, hopefully, we will go to all of the sixth and eighth graders in Berkeley to do two activities. One is to do a reverse science fair where our scientists and um, staff members actually create their own trifold as if they were in eighth grade again. And they come down and present them to the eighth graders. The eighth graders are then judging them on their science communication skills and how well they understand the science that was communicated. So this has been done so far at Willard and King Middle School, and we will be at Longfellow next month. Um, and we're looking forward to expand this program in the future to other cities. Uh, for sixth graders, we are going and doing hands-on activities with sixth graders. So again, we've gone to Willard, we've gone to King, we'll be at Longfellow in April doing hands-on activities and mostly uh, teachers are requesting coding. So we've been doing coding activities with them. Uh, you'll see Jen and some familiar faces, Jocelyn helping me out um, at our Oakland STEM nights we, once a month. Um, we've been partnering with Oakland LEAF to uh, create STEM nights for elementary school students. Um, and again, we'll look to supporting some additional groups next year, at least get to all of the elementary schools that Oakland LEAF goes to next year. And in addition, we've just been creating more and more partnerships to help us um, go out into the community. So those STEM nights are also supported by the Lawrence Hall of Science, um, the Bay Area Discovery Museum, Scientific Adventures for Girls, um, Benita the Bumblebee, and I'm probably forgetting one other um, person that's uh, supporting us, but they we've all been going out and doing those STEM nights together. So that's where we are in six through eight, where we're giving awareness, we're doing hands-on activities, getting students excited about STEM. And nine through 12, we're thinking about how can we do work-based learning? And we're thinking about what are the investments of the future? Where is our nation making investments? What are we actually putting into the research that's happening at the national labs? And where can students be a part of that system? So we think of workforce, education, and diversity. How can we hit all of those specific pegs or markers within the work that we're doing in K-12? So the first part is definitely working with our researchers. We wanna make sure that we know again what they need to be a part of the workforce. So some examples, we're working with Vivek Mutilik to actually incorporate some microbiology into our apprenticeship program so students get more hands-on and wet lab skills. Bert DeJong as a part as the director of the Quantum Systems Accelerator. We have a quantum camp and he's also been a mentor for quantum, uh, for quantum mentorship and projects for high schoolers for the past few years. Blastamil um, is a part of Trent Northern's group that's been working on the Ecofab project that you all may have heard about, but basically a, a closed system to grow plant life and monitor plant life. Students have been able to do that for the past four years that we've been working with them. VRAP is helping us develop a machine learning module to look at uh, biofuels and how to uh, detect the risk or um, select the best biofuels um, for jet, jet engines. Danny Ushizima is helping us develop more machine learning around looking at the ecofabs that we're going to incorporate from Trent Northern's group in order to, again, think about biology and machine learning together. And finally, Suzanne Baker has uh, created a project for students to intern with her this summer around looking at Alzheimer's development in the brain. This is just like a sample selection, but it shows how much the lab is a part of the K-12 um, programs that we are developing and students are getting real world connections to scientists as well as learning about research. So, if you're going to do a program like this that is very involved, is mostly free or a paid opportunity, you have to create transparency. You can't make, you can't allow for students to kind of slide in or know somebody um, or not create opportunities for everyone to um, be able to apply. So we do have, like I said, our website. 
We have for the past couple of years um, launched applications on the same day every single year, and we try to close them on the same day every year so people just know that those programs are going to happen and that they can read about them on our website. We also understand the gaps. So there are barriers to STEM participation. And as we're developing these really authentic STEM experiences, we also want to be mindful of the barriers to learning um, and to being a part of these programs. So in 2022, we launched a bilingual STEM camp that happens in April. Students get an opportunity to be on the lab's site for three days. Um, we take part in workshops hands-on um, projects. They also go to UC Berkeley's campus and we've been um, fortunate to partner with the physics department and with uh, the engineering department this year to have students get a full-on few days to immerse themselves in science and STEM careers at Berkeley Lab as well as UC Berkeley and in both of their languages, uh, English and Spanish. So our staff members, um, and especially our um, employee resource groups, our LANA, Latin, Amer Latin American and Native American Employee Resource Group also support this program as well. We have our one week program that's residential. So SAGE is an opportunity for young women and those underrepresented by gender to be a part of STEM. This is again for students who are still deciding whether or not they want to be in STEM. We've had about 150 plus students participate since 2020. Again, we've gone from virtual to hybrid to in-person and now to overnight. Uh, this is a program that we do in collaboration with the other California national labs and actually um, multiple national labs, including Fermilab in Illinois, um, Brookhaven in New York, or Oak Ridge in Tennessee also do this program as well. So we have a full complete complex wide program that many of us do in our supporting. As I mentioned, we have a quantum camp that's now been expanded from one week to four weeks this summer. Students will have an opportunity to be on site, get mentored by quantum scientists um, and take part in um, additional field trips and other connections with STEM staff. Um, this is a project that we do in collaboration with Sandia National Lab, which is located in New Mexico. So um, this is, a, again, a way we're collaborating and showing team science as well, even in K-12 programs. Our Berkeley Lab Director's Apprenticeship Program was one of the first programs we launched back in 2020 when we were still all remote and quarantining. Um, our staff members drove laptops around the Bay Area to drop off to students. And now the students are actually coming on site. Um, we do our first week, we actually go to the Botanical Garden, thanks to Lou and the team. And they host us as the first part of the week that the students spend with us. They spend six weeks learning about data science, Python, um, and a number of other things. This program is supposed to reflect the Bay Area in terms of race and ethnicity, as well as we want it to reflect in gender. Um, we're actually, I think because of the previous programs, doing a pretty good uh, job of uh, imp or having young women sign up and be a part of the programs. We do wanna balance it out just a little bit more, but we are thinking that a lot of the students don't feel like we um, are the scary big place that they don't want to apply to. And that's what we wanna put out there. Again, we think we're also reflecting the Bay Area in this program. In terms of skill sets, the students are learning Python. And so we actually test to see how well they're doing. So you can see between the pre-test and the post-test, which is in yellow, they actually do learn skills like variables, functions, lists, dictionaries, pandas, loops. For those of you who do code uh, um, some, you'll see that they're getting a lot more questions correct at the end of the day, um, at the end of their six weeks. And we actually continue with them throughout the year. They do a data science project with us um, to keep them engaged. We actually do keep in touch with them post high school. So you can see that quite a few are going off to UC Berkeley. And this is about um, recording about 60 of the students. We've had about 85 come through the program, but 60 students reporting back of where they're going to post, uh, post high school. And then we also see that they are saying they're very confident in their um, 
skill sets and abilities in data science post program, as well as they are much more confident in their problem solving or using STEM research and problem solving uh, tools. So we get to build relationships with those students. And this is one example, Evelyn, who did our Science Accelerating Girls STEM Engagement um, program in 2021 online. She was then in person for a Berkeley Lab Apprenticeship Program. And then she was in person and hybrid for the internship program. And she is not an anomaly. We actually have multiple students come back to us for multiple summers and take part in programs. They really actually want to come back and um, engage more and more. So we're trying to, again, build that relationship so that they do come back um, post high school into college and beyond. And we set high standards. So we do have a traditional internship program that I'll finally talk about. Um, we've launched a fall and spring internship specifically with Christo Ray de La Salle. Um, it's a high school in Fruitvale where students um, are having a work study opportunity. So every single student in the entire school goes to work at one point during the week for their entire school year. Um, this program is being supported by Michael Brandt in the operations director, uh, operations side. And so students have been placed with mentors in our earth and uh, environment, health and safety uh, spaces in our directorate, as well as in, um, with our uh, lab photographers. And so they're getting an opportunity just to learn about work and learning. And um, we're hoping to build out this program even, even more, but we have four students in that program that have been with us since the fall of 2023 and will finish up in May of 2024 and may come back next year. We do have a summer internship program, which is probably one of our most coveted programs that we've developed over the past few years. It is. Uh, it started in 2021. Um, we've seen it go from about 100 applicants to, as of today, and I still have another two weeks of the application being open, we are um, going to have about five, we are at 500 plus applicants. We'll take about 60 students for this individual uh, mentorship program where students are placed on a project with a mentor. And just to get a little bit out of this, um, so we've had about 75 plus projects over three years. We've had three hires as undergraduates, students submitting to the American Chemical Society um, Conference. Um, this is a nature microbiology cover design that one of our um, program alum um, was able to do and had uh, published last April. She still works um, in our Joint Bioenergy Institute with her former mentor. Uh, Colin Zhang is one of our uh, high school students who was recently hired by his mentor, Yang Ha. Um, this is his name on uh, authorship, having authorship and a publication um, before he graduates from high school um, in a chemistry, uh, a journal in um, biology, actually, um, using our advanced light source. So this is our cohort from last year when we got everybody to be on site. Um, and we are looking forward to more students next year. So I'm just gonna wrap up really quickly and say that again, confidence in their STEM research skills goes up pretty well after the program and they are looking to pursue additional opportunities at Department of Energy National Laboratories in the future. Um, and hopefully we can even get some of those maybes over to the yes in future years. Um, and a lot of this uh, work has gone into thinking about, you know, building in sustain sustainability. And we are fortunate this year to have been awarded two um, grants from the Department of Energy to support our Berkeley Lab Director's Apprenticeship Program, also known as Interdisciplinary Pathways to Machine Learning and Data Science, and QCAMP, Building New Pathways for Quantum Workforce with Sandia National Laboratory. So that bought, brought a significant amount of funding into our budget this year, and we should hopefully um, be able to renew that for another two years, and we're pursuing additional funding to support um, a bioscience-related uh, program in the future. And so for us, we're looking at long-term funding for staff and programming that we're going to continue to work on we want to eventually expand to virtual programs and uh, or back to virtual programs now that we have on-site programs and increase our on-site capacity and infrastructure and actually um, 
because of Michael, we're also expanding. We will have a new multi-purpose room and a new wet lab as of this year um, that we will be teaching students in. So no more conference rooms for us, hopefully after June. Um, and students will be able to get that real world experience uh, with us. And uh, with that, I'll just say thank you. And um, again, I don't do this alone. I have a team of uh, staff members that all work together um, with me to support me uh, and support all of the programs that we that you saw just now. Um, and we're just really happy that we've been able to launch them all over the past few years. Fantastic. Thank you, Faith. This is such important work. Those students are going to own the future, and the more we get in there, the better. It's fantastic. And uh, I'm sure everyone here shares your passion for uh, engaging young people in these STEM fields. And uh, we have a lot of people here for that reason. So any questions or comments following up on Faith's uh, presentation? Uh, Marcos? I'd just like to comment. Well, first, thank you, Faith. And uh, also, thanks. Uh, shout out to Michael. Um, just really impressed. Uh, I had a kid that went through the Berkeley schools, um, did hear some of the rumbling about about the outreach program, how it works, how it's integrated. And as you're going through, um, I don't know what's going on with the Zoom, but as you, you went through um, your presentation, I had, I had these questions would come up. And you hit just about every answer, just about all the questions that were coming up for me. I just such an impressive, uh, uh, impressive pr uh, presentation. Um, really love seeing all the metrics and that you're tracking things. And uh, it's going to be exciting to see how things move forward. I, I, I really love the work you've done. Thank you so much. We have our, our first cohort will be seniors in um college this coming fall. And I actually have one person on my team who's from that first cohort. So she does our social media and our newsletters and is majoring in mechanical engineering um, at UC Berkeley. Incredible. That's great. Any other questions or comments here? Okay. Well, once again, thank you, Faith. Let's give uh, Faith a round of applause here. Very well done and exciting. Um, I know the lab has maintained a partnership with Berkeley Community Scholars. I'm sure they're factored into the picture here somewhere. We've had representatives of that organization participating on the CAG. So it's, it's, a, it's a great ecosystem of support for our young people that, that you're leading here. So uh, we are doing good on time. And so one thing we wanted to also share before we wrap up is uh, just a brief overview from the past where we've talked about future CAG discussion topics. And without going over all of the topics uh, here tonight, I just wanted to remind you that this document exists and then we're gonna send it out for you to review and give us feedback as to what possible CAG topics we might take on for future meetings, for presentations, for discussion. And so you can see some of the recent things that came up here on my screen, revisiting the presentation from Marin Community Energy regarding potential collaboration or student placement opportunities. Uh, similarly, with nonprofit organizations in Berkeley and some of our classic subjects like energy conservation, STEM programs, hazard mitigation. We've talked a lot about that and it came up tonight in Ellen's presentation about the wildfire risk reduction program, the tree removal, that factors in here. We might want to do more on that. Uh, bio preparedness was another topic, local climate change information, research about climate adaptation, and there's just a whole long listing of things, many of which we covered again here this evening, but we're gonna send this out to you for your review. And if you have ideas, if this stimulates something that you'd like to propose as a topic, we're all ears. We'd like to get that. And we always like to prepare in advance for any of these uh, CAG meetings as we go uh, through the year. 
And as you know, we're at five meetings per year. Uh, the next meeting is going to be June 10th. So hopefully that's in your calendars. We will make sure that uh, we get more information out to you just as a reminder. But as you contemplate possible presentation topics, you'll let us know in advance. We can queue those up. Maybe you all would be interested in providing a presentation to your fellow CAG members. We've also done that in the past and we're definitely open to that. Um, and so we always ask if there's any other items of note that you wanna bring up before we wrap up this evening. And particularly if there are members of the community at large that are not officially on the CAG, if there are any such voices, we'd love to hear from you. I'm not seeing any, but we always ask the question before we wrap up. Anything else before we wrap up, Jen? Do you have anything else we need to cover or mention in the way of announcements here? Nope, I think you've got it all. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, great. Thank you uh, for all of you staying with the CAG. We want to keep this interesting, keeping it moving forward. So let us know in the meantime, and we'll get a summary out to all of you as we do every meeting. And we look forward to seeing you on June 10th. So stay well, stay connected. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night.